Our motivation for this project was an interest in the emergent landscape of policies in the United States and elsewhere in support of the green energy transition. As political scientists, we were interested in the politics that facilitates action in some cases, impedes it in others, and shapes the nature of whatever responses that do emerge. There's a recognition that typical energy transitions unfold over 50 to 100 years, and the urgency of the climate challenge means that we don't have that kind of time. That transition to zero carbon energy has to be telescoped into a shorter time frame over the next few decades. And while market developments in renewables and electric vehicles are favorable, even those developments didn't and won't transform the energy landscape without concerted government policy. Among the areas of more energetic policy of late are ambitious industrial policies where governments are actively supporting domestic industries. Perhaps none more important to American audiences is the Inflation Reduction Act, which miraculously passed the U.S. Congress after we initially submitted the proposal for the project. We invited some of the brightest academic minds to contribute their thoughts and ideas about the clean energy transition and industrial policy. In the accompanying memos and videos, we wanted to spend a bit of time on how the Inflation Reduction Act came into being. Our contributors examine in more detail the instruments and arguments for industrial policy more broadly. They explore the wider comparative context for clean energy transitions. Finally, a number of our contributors anchor the transition in the wider international politics of the moment. In this opening video, we bring these diverse perspectives together, first to explore the political and policy foundations of the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States with contributions from Alex Gazmararian, Jesse Jenkins, and Leah Stokes. Nate Jensen and Jonas Nam then share some cautions from experience both in the United States and internationally about incentives and industrial policy. Another set of contributors, Dominic Bednar, Mikhail Aklin, and Sandeep Pai, then talk about the likely challenges of adjustment and a just transition for communities experiencing energy poverty and the effects of transition on heavily affected fossil fuel sectors. In another segment, colleagues Jennifer Haddon and Anna Britt talk about the politics of the transition are changing both in the United States and internationally as we move beyond simple binaries of private sector interest opposed to the transition, environmentalists in favor. This discussion is followed by remarks from Tom Hale and Jessica Green on how the transition affects global governance of the private sector and what the key challenges are. Joanna Lewis and I separately then bring the issue back to U.S.-China relations and the complications of the transition of emergent geopolitical rivalry before Todd Tucker turns towards possibilities for transatlantic cooperation in this space. We hope that the broader memos and videos serve as sources of inspiration for research and teaching and provide helpful insight to policymakers as they grapple with the complexities of action at this important moment. For the first time in history, something like the full financial weight of the federal government is now aligned behind the clean energy transition. The 117th Congress of the United States, which sat from 2021 to 2022, passed a package of laws, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the Chips and Science Act, and most importantly, the Inflation Reduction Act, which represent a turning point in the politics of climate and clean energy policy in the United States, and the most significant acceleration of the nation's decarbonization efforts to date. Prior failed attempts at comprehensive federal climate policy focused primarily on carbon pricing, to increase the private cost of climate pollution and shift economic incentives towards cleaner alternatives. In contrast, the successful legislative actions of the 117th Congress focus on making clean energy cheaper and represent a climate policy strategy centered on public investment, innovation, and industrial policy rather than carbon pricing and regulation. And public opinion matters for two reasons. First is that the public's preferences are an important input into elite beliefs about what the public wants, which shapes the incentives of leaders to pursue political reforms. The second reason is that the energy transition will require both community acceptance of new clean energy projects in their backyards, but also that members of the public make consumption choices aligned with decarbonization goals, like buying electric vehicles. Now, when it comes to the IRA, the bill's design overcame barriers that limited previous reform attempts. Primarily, the reformers maximized benefits and minimized costs. So I think that politicians felt that um, the public was quite concerned about this issue. Um, but, you know, when we think about what public opinion is, and I know folks like Bob have critiqued this in the past, um, it's it's a, it's a lifeless thing in a certain sense. It has to be activated by activist groups, by folks communicating to politicians. And that's where I think uh, a lot of the movement actually came from. 
And the promise is essentially that as a result of these in policy interventions, we'll see full domestic supply chains that kind of invent these new technologies that can commercialize them and manufacture them domestically. And the reality in these industries is that uh, we rarely get these, uh, these domestic industries, but we rather get sort of an integration of the domestic economy with much broader global supply chains. Um, and a key segment of each of these supply chains is located in China today. Incentives at one level of government affect incentives at other levels of government. There are bidding wars for EV factories. There are competitions across states for solar and wind projects. Um, and in some ways, the unintended consequence of programs like the IRA, IRA if not well designed, uh, is it can generate even more tax incentives at the state and local level, which can harm taxpayers. But in many places, it's school districts that are paying a large percentage of, of tax incentives. Energy poverty refers to the inability of a household to access or afford adequate energy services. These might include heating, cooling, lighting, and appliances. It disproportionately affects lower income, black, Latin A, indigenous, and elderly adults. Previous research has demonstrated that spatial, racial, and socioeconomic disparities exist in energy consumption, efficiency, and affordability. According to the United States Energy Information Administration's 2020 Residential Energy Consumption Survey, more than 30% of U.S. households were challenged in meeting their energy needs. I'd like to make two points. So first, what are some of the features of the fossil fuel sector that could make this reallocation of labor of workers complicated? And these, as we'll see, have to do with geography and the local importance of fossil fuel employers. The second point is, what are the implications of these features uh, for public policy? Have actors like policymakers, governments, uh, nonprofits taken them into account? And what kind of challenges can we expect as countries like the US and others move forward uh, with similar policies? Maybe there are some lessons to be learned, um, for instance, for the future of the Inflation Reduction Act. That different countries around the world are at different stages of coal transition. So you have OECD countries where the coal fleet is old, you know, um, OECD, many OECD countries like US have found shale gas and the renewable energy is growing. Uh, and in these countries, you know, coal is in terminal decline. But not all countries are the same. Uh, you have countries like South Africa where coal is providing almost 90% 90, 90 of their electricity. Uh, in that country, uh, you know, coal is not declining. It's not in any kind of decline. However, the growth of coal sector has uh, plateaued and it's not going to grow further. And then you have countries in Asia, uh, for example, like India, where coal is still growing, although slowly uh, compared to what how it was growing 10 years ago or five years ago. Many of us have written about these politics for years in terms of um, this kind of dichotomous good guy, bad guy story. So these clean energy constituencies that are out there fighting these dreaded incumbents. Uh, and yes, I think there are still anti-renewable incumbents out there for sure. But when I look at the landscape of energy politics, I feel like something has changed in the 15 years that I've been working in this field. Um, there are many cases now where we see incumbent industries who are working to advance clean energy. Um, for example, we see legacy automakers building EVs. We see at least some utilities out there who are moving forward um, aggressively on 100% renewable or clean energy or net zero goals. Uh, this is a great opportunity for accelerated progress. And uh, I would love to see more research that's examining this heterogeneity uh, among incumbent interests, as well as thinking about processes of engagement um, and kind of how these incumbent interest move from being anti-renewables to actually being engaged participants in the transition. So civil society groups have gotten really good at opposing coal projects and targeting their finance, etc. A lot of this is focused around targeting existing plants in the U.S. and Europe and proposed coal-fired power plants abroad. And through doing this, I think this movement has contributed to decreasing the social acceptance of coal. And social acceptance really matters in this space, as a lot of research shows us, because it influences which projects get built. So projects that don't have social acceptance can be delayed or they can even uh, fail.
that the nature of private governance around net zero in particular, but climate change more broadly, is in some ways quite different from some of the previous episodes we've seen, where kind of forest, forest stewardship council and marine stewardship council or the sweatshop uh, rules of the 1990s era uh, voluntary standards were about um, solving market externalities through market-based tools um, and never achieved a really, um, you know, what, I, what you might say is a transformational change. It seems this climate focused stuff is quite different and that's trying to really reshape the economy overall. Uh, climate change, global climate politics is best understood as a problem of existential politics. That for you know, three plus decades, we've thought about uh, climate change as you know, the mother of all uh, market failures and collective action problems and therefore what we need are international institutions to deter free riding. And in fact, that's not the case. Uh, we argue that actually um, we should understand <clears throat> climate politics as driven by asset revaluation. And asset revaluation creates this problem of existential politics, which is basically like distributional politics on steroids. So um, assets will be revalued as a result of both climate change and climate policy. Um, and as a result of that, some, um, <clears throat> Some assets will no longer be viable. Some ways of life will be completely um, eliminated. And so people will fight like hell, basically, to preserve the value of their assets. There are significant risks to decoupling from China in the clean energy sector in terms of jeopardizing our ability to meet global climate targets. Across clean energy supply chains, there are bottlenecks that necessitate unrealistic production scale up in a full decoupling scenario. Removing China from solar PV supply chains, for example, would require an increase in wafer production capacity of over 5,000%. Lithium refining capacity for battery production would have to grow by more than 8,500%. And um, it is highly unlikely that such growth rates could be achieved in the short time frame remaining until 2030. We know that battery and solar technologies will likely be a major driver of economic development for the United States in the years to come, and that national economic competitiveness will provide the resources to support military capability. From that perspective, allowing a pure competitor to control all of that supply chain would undermine the country's growth potential. This puts us on the side of there being more national security risks of interdependent supply chains than Davidson et al., which would suggest more ally shoring and more domestic production is warranted. But there's a balance. Benchmark source suggests no more than 3 or 4% of domestic cathode and anode demand will be produced in North America by 2030. So the U.S. is still going to need a lot of imports, probably from China in the short run. There's second some discrete arenas for cooperation where there's been some early uh, early positive signs. Uh, the global arrangement on sustainable steel and aluminum is one here where the U.S. and EU agreed to basically create a plurilateral docking mechanism uh, in trade law parlance to do ambitious sectoral decarbonization in highly traded, highly emitting uh, sectors like steel and aluminum. Um, that was announced in October 2021, and negotiations are continuing through October 2023 of this year. And if that works, I think that, that will be a good template for ways to do uh, sectoral cooperation in other spaces. Hi everyone, I'm Professor Nathan Jensen of University of Texas at Austin, and I'm supposed to summarize our conference, Go Green Fast, but you could probably tell from the tone of my voice, it's almost impossible to summarize this. My best summary is there are individual videos from each contribution, uh, also memos that are great um, and exciting, and in many cases ask interesting questions that maybe we can't answer yet. Um, but gives us an incredible guidance on how to start to ask the question and to hopefully answer it. What's my quick summary of, you know, the broad themes? One, you know, one big question was, how did it happen? We didn't predict the Inflation Reduction Act when we put in the grant for this conference. And I think that's probably where the most consensus was within the room uh, and the contributors, that something very different happened. And, and part of this was a change in strategies of the types of policies that we're going to enact and a focus in particular on the carrots and less of the sticks in climate policy. Um, there's more to this. There's the role of different societal actors, interest groups, communities in pushing for the Inflation Reduction Act, but also modelers like Jesse Jenkins um, doing some important work 
showing us what are the economic benefits and costs, uh, but also the environmental impact. So I think that's where we had the most agreement. I think where we had maybe less agreement, or I should say more questions and less conclusions, was will this work, right? And what does this mean even for it to work? What are the environmental impacts? And I think most of us in the room aren't climate scientists, so climate scientists, so it's difficult for us to say, but you know, in terms of job creation, in terms of the durability of the politics, um, will the Inflation Reduction Act remain as is, or will it be cut back? Will important parts be changed? I think there is interesting debates, right? There are also debates about whether or not even the winners, right, that we are generating green jobs do we have the capacity to do this? Does the U.S. have the institutions in place for this economic transition? Um, there's success in other parts of the world, but there's also failures, right? And, and can we learn the lessons from this? And I think there's less of a conclusion and more of an area where we have to ask more questions, but also distressed communities, right? To what extent are communities that are harmed by climate change but also communities that are harmed by these policies, right? A transition from coal is going to have major impacts in some communities. Um, there's some optimism from this conference, right? We have some real concrete examples from the Inflation Reduction Act of attempts to help these communities. Uh, but also when we move farther out, we think about China and, and one striking example was think about a community in China with tens of thousands of coal workers. Do we want them to migrate? Can they all economically transition at the same time? The scale of some of these problems, when we think broadly, is, is quite large. I don't have anything conclusive to say here other than, you know, it was an incredibly interesting and informative debate. Um, and I think it's probably one area that if you're just in the, interested in this policy space, there's no substitute for going through the actual memos. And then, you know, we could quickly go out even more broad and say important issues like national security were addressed. Can we decouple the United States? Can the United States decouple from China? Lively debate across memos on this. Uh, what about the lessons and, and the experiences of other countries? Can this transition occur in the same way? Uh, to what extent is public opinion pivotal in this, right? And, and, and how can we think about support for climate action, but also global institutions. And, they, and I think there was just a wide range of interesting questions about both the institutions and, and what, to what extent these institutions have already shaped economic and, and climate policy, but also institutions like the World Trade Organization. And to what extent are these institutions built for another time? And, and do they have to be changed? or scrapped for us to address these major questions, but also voluntary uh, global institutions can be important as well. So, you know, again, there's no substitute for you actually watching the videos and the memos, but hopefully that this conference, you know, asked important questions and, and got people together thinking through where is their consensus and where do we need more research. So I highly recommend the individual pieces and thank you for listening.